Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hi, Paul. You know, today we have on our show a favorite guest, master storyteller Linda Olson. Linda has a brand new book that demonstrates how to use your discipline of storytelling to, as her subtitle states, to empower your hope when going through tough times. I love that. As I was chatting with Linda earlier this week, I came to the realization that I'm surprised that it took me so long to come to this realization and that there's a huge difference between stories in life and our life stories. In our previous podcast with Linda, we talked primarily about stories in life and how to develop those stories in a lucid and concise manner. And we will continue a bit with that in the show today. But I'd like to talk about something a little different, and that is the value of your life story, your narrative, you know, what your life is about and how that story impacts your life. I'm very much looking forward to this. Linda is a best-selling author, TEDx speaker, and founder of Wealth Through Stories. As a former college dean and marriage and family therapist, Linda brings us deep knowledge of personal transformation through telling your own story. With that, let's bring on Linda Olson. Linda, welcome to the next chapter with Charlie. Oh, thank you so much. A privilege to be here. Yeah, it's fun to chat with you again. We've had some good conversations. Yes, we have. So tell me, Linda, you have a new book, um, a yeah. brand new book. Didn't you tell me it just came out last week? Uh, actually, uh, this one came out a few months ago. Oh, but it's okay. still new to me, yes. <laughs> oh, but it's still new to you. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a bit about it? What's the, what's the thesis behind it? How is it different than your, your master storytelling? Well, uh, my previous books have basically been, uh, particularly Your Story Matters, has been helping others put together their story and giving them some tools and, and training and insights in terms of how to do that. This one is different in the sense that I, I came across, uh, I come across on a regular basis people with uh, just amazing stories. They're ordinary people with extraordinary stories. And I thought, you know, I need to gather those stories and help these people get their stories out to impact thousands, perhaps even millions. So this particular book is um, it's a collaborative book in terms of I gather there's seven people's stories in this book. And um, they really share their life stories. So let's take a step back and let's identify this. What, how do you identify the difference between your life story, your life narrative, and stories about your life? Do you see a, do you see a difference between those two? Oh, there's a big difference, and that's a great question. The best way I can probably break this down is that I see stories falling into kind of three basic categories. The, the first one is what I call our everyday stories. These are stories that unfold every day. Uh, they may be, um, you know, just something, a simple and inspirational kind of story, or it may be also a combination of something that's been going on for, for a while. But it's our everyday stories, like I said, they unfold every day. They're usually our smaller stories. The second category... This would be the story of, say, um, a wife comes home from work and tells a story of the situation that happened during the day at, at the job. Could be as simple as that. Or for me, the most fun everyday stories are when the grandkids come over and... When they, by the time they leave, I'll, I've always got more stories. They're so funny. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I hear. I'm I'm yet to reach grandfather status, so I don't know. But that's well, you have a lot to look forward to. <laughs> I hear that. I you know people continue to tell me that. So so, and and there is an art to telling these stories, is there not? 
It really is in terms of being able to share them particularly on a professional basis. But you can use that same framework of storytelling with whether you're talking to your neighbor, whether you're talking to a friend, perhaps somebody at your church um, or at your work, or they can be used in, um, you know, if you're speaking somewhere as well. So there, there is, yes, um, a professional way to tell these stories. What is the? What would you say is the purpose of these stories? Are we trying to, are we trying to reveal something about ourselves? Or are we just trying to make for interesting conversation? Are you, you know what's the what's the purpose of the everyday stories? What what would what would life be like if we didn't do that? You know, I believe the biggest purpose is to connect with one another. Mm. It's just, it's a great way to connect. It's a great way to get to know you, and it's a great way for whoever you're speaking to, you know, to get to know, get to know the speaker, get to know the person. So it's like stories. We actually think in stories, and that's what we remember best. I had a friend just last week. Um, I'd gone to a very special event, and um, I I told her about it, and I told her a couple of stories in there, and she says, how do you remember this? I can't remember those things. And I said, well, they're stories. I love stories, so I always remember stories. And um, it is the best way, because stories are a way of experiencing each other. And um, and its experience is our best teacher. I love that. I'm I'm you know I've been studying experience in a number of different um, disciplines right now, and I and I do, I think the idea of experiencing one another is so critical. And how do you do that if it's just strictly didactic, talking about philosophies or meanings or? instances without telling a story around it that 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 engages the personalities into all the complexities that happened in this scenario i i i so agree with that so we have everyday stories and Mm -hmm. and they are 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 richer and less rich depending just depending on the particular story sometimes that everyday story can be a huge story and and sometimes it's just a fun little anecdotal incident that happened that wasn't that wasn't that fun um, right you have a second you have a second category yes the second category is our turning point stories and those are stories that uh well literally um are a turning point in our life, some change in our our circumstances, an event. Uh, It could be perhaps even something somebody said. And for some reason, it inspired us, triggered something enough for us to take action in doing something or making some kind of change in our life. So those are often much bigger stories. And, you know, when they're happening, I find for myself, when those turning point stories are happening, I'm not really thinking about that being a turning point stories. Often, uh, especially if I'm in the midst of conflict, I'm just thinking about how can I make it through this conflict. But when I look back and pull the pieces together, I'm thinking, wow, this really did have a significant impact in my life. Can you give me an example of that, Linda? Well, I can. Um, I'll Uh, tell you uh, what, uh, I've just been tracing some of these turning point stories um, for a special project, and I was just writing, before you called, one of those stories out, and it's actually when I came to graduate school, And I know you and I shared a number of uh, people we knew in common from graduate school. Well, for 
five years I'd been trying to get into this particular program. And um, five years and three rejections later, a door opened up that wasn't the program I wanted to get into, but it was on the same campus as the program I wanted to get into. So I came down, it felt like second best to me, but it was the only door that opened. And so as I came down, came to summer school, through a series of events, it turned out a few months later, I was accepted into the program I had tried to get in for five years. I was accepted on probation. And for the first time in my life, I enjoyed my studies. And long story short, two years later, I graduated with a double master's, high honors, and my fiance standing next to me. <laughs> now, there are many turning points in that story. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of turning points in that story. I, I think, I think do, you, do you think in today's volatile political climate that turning point stories are ever more critical than they have been in the past? Oh, I do. And, you know, to me, the key is um, there are many things in our life that are turning points if we allow it and if we are willing to take a look at what did I learn from this, whether it turned out the way I hoped it would or whether it didn't. But what can I learn from that? That, to me, is the biggest part of story. It's not how big the event was or how big the transformation was. To me, it was how big is the lesson that I've learned through this. And so to me, yes, absolutely in this climate, um, there are, you know, there's so much disappointment, regardless of where we stand, so much loss. And if we can just take a look at that, and rather than getting stuck, in those disappointments or in the loss, step back a few steps and say, you know what? What can I learn from this? And that alone will be your turning point story. You know, I'm, I'm going to take a little detour here because I've got, I've got, it's sort of a pet, a pet, I don't want to call it peeve, but it's a pet concern. And that when it comes to media, that we have a tendency, you, you know, and let's just for general, for general language, we'll call it right and left, and and that those that adopt one frame of reference will only listen to news that supports their frame of reference, and therefore they're just. There's no change. There's no turning point story in that, unless it's just an an egregious or you, you know somehow supporting and making a position stronger, and and it happens with with all, all kinds of 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 these of these different news outlets. What I'm wondering: Do you think we can find turning point stories by listening to the opposite of what we believe? Oh, I believe we can, because exactly, you know, I agree exactly what you're saying. There's no turning point stories when we're just accepting one point of view. In fact, that's where we often stay stuck, you know, and it's that way. And if we're doing that with the news, for example, we're doing the same thing in our life. We're only open to the people that agree with us. We're only open to, uh, we're not willing to look at um, other perspectives. And so what, what are we going to learn from that? If they already agree, um, you know, that's great. But what do we learn from that? Yeah, these become more like everyday stories. If I'm, if I'm just repeating what I already believe, they're just stronger and more consistent everyday stories. They're not turning point um, how does one, you know, I just mentioned media as one particular 
outlet. How does how does one go about discovering turning point stories? Because I think they're I think they're so important. You know, I've had so many turning points in my life, and and it's it's experimenting with something different than I'm used to. How 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 do we go about that, Linda? And then and then that gives us pardon me that gives us grist for powerful stories well it really does and there's a number of ways we can go about it one of the fun ways that i've gone about doing this um as i train others and that is i uh, i have them on a on a piece of paper eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper let's say and i say draw three upside down v's like mountain peaks just draw, draw three big mountain peaks that take up your whole page. So they do that. And I said, those mountain peaks represent victory. So I said, now name the mountain peak. Tell me, put down three, three victories in your life. And they could be anything like restoring a relationship it could be um, finding your dream job. It could be marriage. It could be having your first child. Many different things. And so as they write the three victories, whatever is a victory to them. Mm-hmm. So they write their victories. I like victories, that, yes. And then under that, I ask them to write uh, three key conflicts prior that happened prior to the victory because especially if it was a significant victory to me the greater the victory the greater the conflict that comes prior to the victory and so then as they write their their uh three conflicts for each victory i said you know what there's your story right there Linda, that's brilliant. I love that. That is really a good idea. Thank you. And you can you can do it the other way around, where you can talk about and ask them first to go, you know, uh, address three major conflicts in their life. But the tendency is we get stuck in the conflict and just focus on that. So if we start with a victory which is our resolution, then it's easier to kind of go back and say, okay, well, what was, what did happen building up to this? And it's amazing what will come out. Really, really quite fun. Yeah, it, it, it reminds me of Joseph Campbell and, and Homer and Odyssey and that they all had to go through very, there's, to, to reach the state of where they would like to go through they they started on these journeys that were very exciting and a very you know potentially eventful and learning opportunities and every time they came across enormous obstacles and and the beauty is they found victory over these obstacles and they and that's what's created some of the greatest you know is that is that not is that not the 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 outline of a victorious of a successful novel and that's what a novel is is going from headlines to breadlines and back again or the opposite breadlines to headlines and back again it's this yes it's just going back and forth and so it it does come let's get to your because i as you notice i'm holding off on signature stories because i really believe in signature (laughs) stories but I want to get all these others. It does come back to the ability to to communicate these stories to other people for the purpose of what? Why do I want to communicate my stories to other people? For the purpose of connecting, of coming alongside, of identifying. The purpose is that it's about you. It's a way that hopefully I can connect with you. So if I'm speaking to somebody who's maybe sharing a problem, a conflict, or maybe some pain that they're in, and it triggers something for me, 
Of course, the key is initially listening to their story and then often asking, you know, would, would it be okay if I just shared a little bit about one of my stories? And of course, they're going to say yes. Then is the opportunity to maybe share something that I would they could identify with and how it brought victory to you. So then it would be likely be a real encouragement to them and so often when they hear your story you know how it is when we hear a speaker and it's we hear where they came from because we just want to see them where they are right now in a place of great victory but very often until we hear from where they came from and the devastation they went through we don't appreciate where they are today because Somehow we just kind of put them on this pedestal and think they just arrived. No, just arrived. That's really, that's, that's very, very insightful. Now, I, I want to get into your expertise in developing stories and how to tell stories um, that are in-depth and yet concise enough that, that people can grasp them. Um, but I, I want to talk about signature stories because that means that means a, a, a lot to me because of of my personal background and that signature stories are really incredible how 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 do you define signature stories well to me the signature stories we started with the everyday stories and then we talked about the turning point stories the signature stories are really those significant or a, a significant story in your life that really is the theme of your of your life. In other words, whether whether it was a tragedy, whether it was an event, whether it was you know such a major turning point that it had an effect the rest of your life, that to me is a signature story. Is that something that, that typically happens in youth, or does it happen later? You know what? Um, I, I, that's a good question. I've never really thought about that. Um, I think a lot of times it does probably happen earlier on in life, whether it's specifically youth or not, but earlier on in life. Because you know how it is, that's when at youth, college, so forth, that's when we're making some of the most important decisions in their life regarding a career, regarding a marriage partner, regarding, you know, so many things. And um, and sometimes we don't always make the wisest decisions, but we may also learn the biggest lessons through not making the wisest decisions. And that, in turn, can turn our life around. Two or three things running through my mind now. A signature story most commonly it would seem to me happen in the younger ages is the way you were you were trained, you were developed and then you and then you found a counter or another way to deal with life and that that creates your signature story. But but with some people, signature stories happen much later in life. With, For instance, a divorce can be a signature story, can it not? Yes, it can. And again, it's, uh, it's not the divorce, but it's what I learned from the divorce really becomes a signature story. But it may be the divorce where it was initiated. I, I I like that it's the 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 story is almost less important than what I learned from the story. It's not that it's less important, but it's a it's a vehicle to say what I learned. Right, and I believe if more people could understand that, they would be surprised at finding a signature story in their life because. I have, for example, many people come up to me and say, well, I don't have a major tragedy or a major, you know, something that turned my whole life around. I don't have that. 
And in turn, what they're really saying to me is, so therefore, I don't have a big story or a signature story. And I, I don't agree with that at all, because I really believe if they were willing to take a look at their life, or I'd be happy to sit down with them in half an hour, and I'll bet you anything that with asking a few questions, I could help them find their signature story. Oh, absolutely! Absolutely, um, to say that my life is—it's almost like saying my life has been not impacted by life. We're we are bombarded with impacts and changes and ideas and and strategies and and things going right and things going wrong. And they are they are impacting the way we believe and the way we think. I, I'm curious. Can you, in your in your in your new book, you tell the story of seven women who have overcome significant difficulties, and have stories of. I'm I'm assuming since I've the book just came out and I've not read it. I'm assuming. There's sort of a positive ending to it, you know, sort of positive conclusion to these yeah. stories. Um, what was the difference between them and the people that say, I don't have a story? You know, this is, it's a, it's a process. And these are women who are, have been willing to walk through the process and truly discover some of their, uh, what they learned through some of the most painful things in their life, their painful events. And as they were willing to walk through that, they discovered actually uh, much more. They discovered much more than they ever thought they would. But to realize that that pain and that problem really turned into victory in their life when they recognized how much they learned from it, how they got out of the situation they did, how things turned around for them. Can you briefly give me the story of one woman so I get an idea of what you're talking about? Yes, absolutely. Uh, There's one woman that comes to mind very quickly, and she actually went through uh, significant abuse in her life as she uh, was married to somebody who was an abuser. And in that process, unfortunately, lost her three children, became a weekend mom, and just a very, very difficult situation. Well, in that process, not only had she maintained a relationship with her children, and now, as adult children, uh, she's very close to each of them. And they have come back, and she said, I've been given a second chance to be able to establish the relationship. The time that I felt like I lost and felt so guilty being uh, not being the mother that I wanted to be, now I feel like I've given I've been given a second chance to reestablish that relationship. And interestingly enough, this very same woman, which is really could be a whole separate signature story, uh, two years ago went to the doctor's office, and much to her surprise, the doctor walked in and said, I don't have good news. You have stage four cancer, and there's nothing we can do. There's no treatments available. It's, it's too prolonged. It's gone too far. And she said at that point she came to a choice to live or to die and right then initially she wanted to die and as the doctor talked to her and reminded her of her three wonderful children and different things in her life she said you're right i choose to live And since then, she has written her first book, is working on her second book, is writing an entire children's series, and her art that she had put aside for 20 years 
I had no idea she was an artist. That has returned, and she's doing all the artwork for her children's book. She said, I've never been so fulfilled in my life. And how long of a period of time is this? This is over two years. And the doctor gave her one to five years to live. And she said, my motto is that I live every day with a smile. Now, that's a story. It resonates. It gives hope. Because because it would be so easy to take the opposite viewpoint. What's the use? And giving up. What is it that 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 gave her the courage to live, albeit shorter, but a victorious, a more victorious life. How did she come upon that? I met her a few years ago. I can't remember exactly how many years ago it was, but she started coming to my workshops and learning about story, and we had been working on her initial story, on her past story. She starts seeing the value of story And more than that, the value of life. And I'm just going to make a note at this point. To me, our story is our life. And I believe it's the greatest gift we have been given. And so her thinking had started changing. And when the doctor approached her with this, and I can certainly understand, she was in a you know, a, a devastate. It was a devastating moment, so unexpected. But as the doctor talked with her and helped kind of put things in perspective, she said, "I choose to live." And her, it was like her thinking, her mindset began turning. Because of her cancer, she had lost her job. In fact, she owned her own business. She owned the only, she was the only female Japanese chef in our entire area. And this was a business. It wasn't just a business. It was a legacy that she was carrying on that her parents, and she grew up with, her parents had had Japanese restaurants for, for many years. And she wanted to continue that legacy And unfortunately, three years later, she lost the business. And at that point, in that devastating moment, uh, she said she she had the thoughts of, you know, I I just want to die. It was so devastating for her. And then she said, you called me. And you said, you know, are you writing these things down? What, you know, what have you learned through this? And she said, well, I really don't have time. And I said, can you find one hour in your week? She says, well, of course I can find an hour in my week. I'm not even working right now. And so I invited her over. We had a wonderful talk. And then she told me, I didn't even know. And this is like, this is like a third signature story in her life. It could become that. She said she tried so hard to hang on to her business and worked with her landlord and all kinds of things and nothing was working out and realized she finally had to come to the place of closing the business. But like like I said, it was much more than closing a business. It was like feeling a failure with a legacy she wanted to carry on. She said the very last day that she had to close the business. A lady walked into her restaurant and said, hello, my name is Spring. And she said, I understand you're closing your business. And she said, yes, I am. She said, I would like to purchase all the, the uh, everything that you have here to run the business. And I would also like to like to hire you for my business. And I said, are you serious? I said, her name was Spring. She said, yes, her name was Spring. And it was like literally walking into a new season in her life. It requires a certain amount of wisdom and a certain amount of openness to even be accepting of that. I mean, I could imagine someone saying, that's baloney. I'm not going to do that. 
um, I'm done, I'm out of here. And she, and she decided, did she decide to take her up on the, on the offer? She did, yes. And she worked for her for a few years. The lady ended up off uh, opening up several of her restaurants. And uh, she she hired her as manager of the one, and then a few years later is when when she got cancer and had to end up uh, quitting. But um, you know, I believe the key to finding those stories, the key to all of that, is that openness and the vulnerability to be willing to take a look at that and walk through our pain to see what we can learn from it. You know, I want to take a break right now because I love, I, I, I want to stop on that, um, that, that we need to be open to, uh, that we need to be available to be open and to be vulnerable. And I want to pursue that in storytelling and right after the break, okay? Okay. Hi there, you're listening to Charlie Hedges in the next chapter with Charlie, and my very, very special guest today is Linda Olson, storyteller, and more than storyteller, it's, it's, it's story innovator. It's, it's how to, the, the understanding the importance of story in life and how to develop the story in life. And Linda, we just, we just ended uh, the last, you know, before the break, and we were talking that you were saying two important elements of storytelling is openness and vulnerability. Can you expand on that for me? Absolutely. You know, um, I think one of the hardest parts, the hardest places in life is a willingness to be vulnerable. Because when we open ourselves up to being vulnerable, there's always that risk of getting hurt the risk of rejection. And often when we have experienced significant hurt and rejection in our past, that closes us up. And we're saying, you know what? I will never put myself in that position again. And that's exactly where, unfortunately, we stay stuck in our story. Let's, let, let, we, let, let, let's pursue that just a bit. Um, okay. On vulnerability, you you were talking about the times we were wrong, the times that we failed, the times we were embarrassed, the times when we embarrass somebody else. It's it's those difficult, embarrassing, and you know I hate to use the word shameful, but 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 awkward times in our life, and and. It's important to bring those to light. Is that, is that what you're saying? Absolutely, because when we bring them to light and take a look at what we've learned through the situation, then it's no longer that failure. It's no longer, you know, that embarrassing situation. It may have been embarrassing momentarily, but instead we're using that disappointment, that rejection, uh, whatever it is, and turning it around to become a victory because of what I've learned from it and how I've grown through it. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I, I, I wrote a note down that I'm reading that I that I'm just reading right now, and I like, I, I think it has a lot to do with what you're saying, and that stories are a way of describing life's victories and trials. That. Victories, how, how did I put it? But aren't victories, but aren't victories merely a matter of overcoming obstacles that seem to be so difficult that we can't overcome them? But that is, that is, that is the heart of a good story. It's overcoming a victory. It's facing an obstacle, and it's overcoming a victory. Would would, would does that make sense to you? 
Yes, it does. And, you know, when we overcome that obstacle, whatever that may be, the rejection, the devastation, whatever that is, and take a look at, like I said, what we've learned from it, then it becomes a victory. We no longer are living in our failure, in our defeat, in our rejection, but rather say, you know what? I mean, that was so devastating, and I never thought I'd get past it. But today, I know what I've learned from it and how I've grown from it, and so therefore am wiser and am making better choices. It's really part of that. It's really the healing process. That's what it is. It, it is, and, and, it, and it sounds to me like you are, you are talking to a very mature audience because I am, I am thinking of the majority of stories that I hear from people at work and people in life and the um, uh, bitching and whining sessions. And that mm-hmm. there, there, it's only obstacles. There are no victors. There are victories. There are only villains and mistreating people. And that, and that takes us into a very destructive cycle of which we we have no hope for victory. We have no hope. What, what, what do we do? You, do you have any advice in what we do in that situation where people? I was going to write a blog on whining, and and it just that nothing nothing frustrates me more than whining. You know, just shut the hell up. You know, I don't I don't care. You know, it's just mm-hmm. you know. I mean, a, a brief whine. You know, I mean, I, I get that I'm being mistreated. I'm having some trouble, but I've got to figure out a way to work around this. Too often, the second part doesn't happen. I've got to figure out a way to work around this. There is a feeling I am stuck in this. And this is now going to define my life. How do we encourage people like that? How do you, you know, as a, as a brilliant storyteller, how do you encourage people to, to turn that around and to try to, and to, try to um, create victories out of that? Did that question make any sense? It, it does make sense. And one of the uh, principles that I teach is positioning, positioning ourselves. To me, uh, positioning, uh, if we define that, it's what we do with one thing, we do with all things. And so if we have positioned ourselves as a whiner, then we will tend to approach so many things around us and find what we don't like in the situation as opposed to something positive and if we're willing to take a look back take a look much deeper and say you know it's really it's really what approach do we use in life are we coming from a fear-based approach or are we coming from a place of gratitude a place of abundance And I find that basically whiners and negative uh, thinkers are are usually, almost always, coming from a fear-based approach. Mm. And again, Mm. they're they're not open. It's what we talked about earlier in terms of listening to that same news station and not even consider what the other side might be saying. And so we, that's how we tend to stay stuck, but it's usually out of our fear. And that's kind of going way back in our story. And I, I might just even ask them, depending on how well I know the person, you know, tell me a time when you, uh, you felt very fearful, you were not listened to, you were not heard, um, you know, tell me about a time like that in your life. And if they're willing, of course, to be vulnerable with me, if they trust, and they will, if they trust me enough, and uh, and then take me back. And I'll tell you, it's surprising how often this situation is from childhood, and it could be one incident, and they they're so stuck there, 
and have never considered or gotten the help needed to get beyond that. And so now they're just carrying that same philosophy, if you want to call it that, carrying it out in life. I have a, um, I work with an executive coach, and she is um, reminding me every now and then, she says, okay, who is telling this story? Charlie, the 70-year-old adult, or Charlie, the 12-year-old child? Because if Charlie, the 12-year-old child, is telling the story, there's going to be no hope. There's just going to be, you know, negativity and and downside. But the the 70-year-old has passed through that and has seen that with wisdom and has seen the victories and the accomplishments, you know, along with along with you know a lot of other challenges along the way. It's not been a smooth ride, but um, what what voice are we listening to? Are we listening to the voice of pain, or are we listening to the voice of optimism? Absolutely. So, what do you encourage people to find? To find in your as we're as we're beginning to wrap up here, um, just beginning. I'm not in a big hurry, um, but what do you find are tools that you use in? Helping people develop stories into moving from um, vulnerability to openness, from from pain to hope, from pain to, like you said, finding finding hope. What what sorts of methodologies do you use to give people encouragement in that? Well, um, there are a number of things, of course, that that I offer. One of the most fun things to me is a two-day story retreat that I offer once or twice a year. My next one is in October. And it's a very experiential time and often a small group. But there's such a safety within this small group that even if these people come with you know, uh, a lot of painful stories, and we laugh together, we cry together, we, you know, it, it, but it's just powerful, because obviously you have to feel safe before you're going to be willing to, to share and open up and be vulnerable with people you don't know. So that's, you know, that's one thing that's fun. Um, Another thing... I like that. Is that, is that primarily women, or are there men in that as well? You know what? I I try my best to attract men as well, but unfortunately, you know, sometimes we have a few men, or one or two at least, and they're the real brave and courageous ones, but it does mostly attract women, but it's open to both. Okay, okay. Yes. And, you know, like I said, in this book, Story Matters, Empowering Your Hope While Going Through Tough Times, uh, there are seven significant stories um, in in here, and and it's just everybody has a story chapter, but it's how their life was turned around. And if we can read stories like that, that regardless, it doesn't matter where we started from. What matters is the direction we're going and where we end. And if they can read stories like that, it will hopefully begin to change their mindset. And to know that it doesn't matter, like I said, where we started from, everyone has a choice, and there is hope. There is hope. You know, we we are. I mean, our our, our life. If I'm if I'm understanding you well, and the way I'm I'm taking this, our life is a life of one big story. <laughs> And and we try to make it so didactic, you know. And somebody who is, who is, you, you know, leaning more toward the, toward the, the, the sort of intellectual side, I, you know, I, I I take it away from stories, and I try to take it away to precepts and concepts, and and yet, yet it is all an evolution of stories, is it not? 
I mean, it, it, it is, really it is. is one story after yeah. another story after another story. Mm-hmm. And I, my final question, and I, I, I want to I end with this, and I think this is important. How do you encourage, and you, know, you, you have your storytelling seminars, and you have your books... For our listeners, what would you do to encourage them to begin to think of their life as a life of story, not a life of, of, I'm I'm not sure what the opposite is, a life of just, of just, you know, going through the, going through the motions. But there is a, there is a, there's a wonderful story and there's a wonderful story of, of victories and obstacles and all sorts of things. I mean, you know, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking of marriage, you know, and, and uh, I know a couple of, uh, uh, two couples right now that, you know, have been married for over 30 years and, you know, they went through, they went through a decade or more of difficult times in their marriage. And both of them now, after 30, 35 years of marriage, are saying they're the happiest they've ever been. How, how in the world did that happen? That didn't, that didn't just happen by accident. That happened by them recognizing there were actions and attitudes taking place that are stories that, you know, we can tell in the form of stories, but that have that have resulted in saying those stories didn't work I need to try something new yes and the exciting thing is just the fact that they are now saying you know we've never been so happy in our marriage as we are now tells me that there was an openness to change there was an openness to learn and they were willing to be vulnerable in the process and they are now, you know, walking the wonderful results of that. Obviously, as we know, that doesn't always happen. And um, what, what about those people, Linda? What about the people that just are not open to change and are just stuck in the mire and the muck and can't seem to get out of it? Is there, is there hope for those people or are they just... You know, you're just going to live a crappy life. That's that's all there is to it. Well, unfortunately, that's how they feel in that situation very often. But there is hope. And especially today, there are more resources available, even, you know, support groups. and. But again, you have to be vulnerable to be willing to go to a support group or to call that emergency line for help or, you know, whatever it is. There has to be, we have to be willing to take that first step. Yeah, it's a willingness um, deal, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. But it is a choice. And we don't have to stay there, unfortunately. There are so many lives today that are so confused with so much conflict um, that, um, you know, they don't know which way to turn, and they felt hopeless for so long. But it it doesn't have to be that way. There is hope for everyone. I think that's a wonderful way to wrap it up. I think that's a, a, a brilliant a, a brilliant observation. I will have on the show notes, I will have your social medias. I will have your TEDx talk that people can get to your TEDx talk. Uh, and I will have this new book so they can they can purchase this new book, which I think sounds very hopeful. And people that are feeling on the fence about this, this could be a book that could really help them Help them move toward a more gratifying and satisfying life. Linda Olson, it is always such a a treasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to share with your listeners. Yeah, and I know I shocked you. You weren't prepared for any of the things that I'm talking about today. You thought we were... (laughs) And you and you just were you were brilliant. You know, your your ideas just showed the depth of your knowledge in your subject matter. 
Oh, thank you. But I'm always prepared to talk about stories, so it all fit in. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Linda. And for everybody else, I want to thank you for listening to the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. And uh, I guess I want to say bye for now and see you next time.